Greetings, ladies and mental gents, and welcome to this daily science fiction extravaganza, commonly known as Tales, Tales from Out from space. Out, space, out, space. Out, space. Taken from the subreddit HFY. All the relevant links will be down below. And, as always, I hope that you enjoy. And if you do, please consider supporting the channel. On to the science fiction. Story number one. Humans are weird. Seeds. Kultich woke up a very peculiar grinding noise. He shook off the foggy webs of sleep and slipped out from under the comforter that his particular human friend on his last posting had made for him and walked to the edge of his bunk. He rotated his primary eyes to locate the source of the sound. Perhaps, unsurprisingly, it was coming from his current roommate, a young human who decidedly unhealthy sleep habits. Said human was currently sitting haunched in front of a projected display that appeared to be other humans in a large city of sorts. Grinding sounds appeared to be coming from his mouth. Kultch felt his sensory hairs perk up in interest. What are you eating, Scotty? Kultch asked eagerly. Just some almonds, Scotty replied, absently holding out one hand, the palm up displaying several tapered overloids. I wanted some protein to see me through this episode. I have never seen this food sauce, Kultch said, scurrying along the shelf that wrapped around their room, so that he paused just over the proffered food. Sure you have, Scotty said. The cook puts them in the smoothies all the time. Great source of protein. Kultch clicked his confirmation and carefully picked up a surprisingly heavy object. He clicked in surprise as he examined it. Pardon me, Scotty, Kultch said, but this is a dormant stage seed. The almonds, Scotty replied. I guess so. I think they come from trees. Trees, Kultich said a bit flatly. You're eating unprocessed, dormant stage tree seeds. Scotty looked around him curiously. Yeah. So, uh, Kultch pondered how to phrase the question. Exactly how much pressure are your jaws capable of producing? Scratched if I know, Scotty said. Kultch flexed his gripping appendages over the hard mass of biomatter, calculating how much power it must take to grind the seeds into the requested paste humans preferred to digest. A tiny shiver ran through his carapace at that thought of what destructive power. It was probably a good thing that their mouth openings were so small. Still, there was a wealth of knowledge to be gained here. Such destructive force must leave telltale signs in the humans' bodies. He might even be able to use those signs to determine a method of figuring out human diet from just observing these patterns. Fascinating. End of story. Story number two. Humans are weird, cold footsies, written by Betty Adams. Bright points of light burned down out of the cloudless sky. The stars were only faintly obscured by the light of two small moons. Beneath them, a small huddle of structures stood stoutly against the spreading frost. Between the starlight reflecting off the ice and the giant silver satellite dish standing noble guard over the building, an artist might have called it beautiful, idyllic even. The screaming started around whatever the local equivalent of 3 a.m. was. The human inhabitants and the pseudo-military installation woke up instantly and grabbed for whatever weapons were at hand. The situation was ripe with tension, which, due to the rapid situational analysis natural selection bred into people who survived, almost immediately gave away to irritation, confusion, and then random bursts of profanity. Get it off! Get it off! My back! Cold! The frantic screams were first joined by shouts of warning and then rough laughter. A string of profanity-laced comments marched heavily through the cold, dense air, followed by a shriek, I don't care, get it off. There was a stern mumble that from one tone could only have been from a sergeant, Okay, okay. A faint squeaking of discomfort interpreted the proper words, Cold, cold, get him off then. There was a bit more indistinguishable murmuring, and so no further disturbance was forthcoming, and the weapons were returned to the sheaths, and the camp returned to sleep. Memo to all rough end base personnel, re-acceptable behavior in life-threatening situations, and social duties to fellow sentients in life-threatening situations. 
The command staff asks all personnel to remember that not all species inhabiting rough end base have the same tolerance levels for physical contact. Furthermore, some species that indulge in full-body organism rest, i.e. sleep, Humans, specifically, have different rules for acceptable physical contact when in the sleep state and while awake. Please remember that a human in sleep state is incapable of differentiating between a native predator and a friendly ally. It is suggested that a sleeping human be woken up with no less than three feet away by throwing hard objects at them and vocalizing a non-threatening greeting. The humans of rough end base do recognize that the increasingly harsh conditions can be life-threatening to their smaller and less endothermic allies. They are also aware that their large mammalian bodies generate plentiful excess heat. They, as a rule, are perfectly willing to offer any aid to their fellow sentients that are they are capable of. However, please remember to obtain permission from the selected human before utilizing this benefit of their presence. A human who is woken from sleep state by uh, a gazillion tiny freezing pseudopods crawling up my bare back is prone to make a loud disruptive noise, attempt to remove with an unidentified object from his or her back, and leap wildly around in the sleeping space without a care for who or what they might step on. This can lead to disruption of sleep for others in a sleep state, injuries for both the human and whomever is attached to their back, and significant mental trauma for all participants. If one finds one must obtain warmth immediately to sustain one's continued existence and the proper permission cannot be obtained, it is suggested that one holds on tight. End of story. Story number three. Humans are weird under the mistletoe, written by Betty Adams. Kish took another sip of his eggnog and twitched his mandibles happily. Not had the taste he could really take it or leave the viscous drink. It was a bit too much like a field rations that he had consumed in training. No, his current happy state was due to the bustling and joyful energy that infused the community room and the consulate. Humans bowled around laughing and chatting. Their smaller body trisk delegates either perched on the tables or clung to the outer layer of clothing the humans wore. I really can't see why you all call these sweaters ugly, the ambassador was saying as he passed, clinging to a vibrant mauve number one on the human guests was wearing. The ambassador patted briskly the wool demonstratively. Kisk smiled and shifted his legs so that he could view the room better. As a mere assistant ambassador, he had far fewer duties. In fact, his only official duty was to observe and learn, but he was fairly certain now that he had learned enough from his mentor to serve the function in a small way. There, by the festive Christmas tree, what fun they had exploring it, as if it was ready made for just a trisk bodies and minds, stood the representative of the local military. Just ch- set down his eggnog and scampered over to the man. Pardon me, General, said politely. I note that you are positioned under a dexter plant parasite that I wish to initiate the ritual of inexplicable apology. Ah, forgive me, I mean the kiss. Kiss formed his mandible parts into a smile and lifted up his front legs in the human pick-me-up gesture. The general grinned and admitted a sigh before he reached down and offered his hand to the Trisk assistant ambassador. Merry Christmas, the general said gamely as he lifted the giant spider to his lips. End of story. Story number four. Humans are weird, inanimate objects. Written by Betty Adams. Kulch, can you aid me? Kulch glanced over at his superior as he entered the room. The chief cultural anthropologist was crouched over the main data screen at their office. Kulch balanced the vials on his manipulators and rotated uneasily. Can it wait for a moment, Rickert? He replied. I need to place the samples from the hull vats in the refrigerator. Make sure you place them in the sample refrigerator, Rickert reminded him sternly. But yes, that will be acceptable. Kulch rotated and hurried to put the nutrient samples in the racks of the refrigerator unit. He made sure that their labels were clearly visible and scurried back to the cart with flickering various symbols across his visual display screen. Kulch aligned his primary eyes with the screen and tilted his abdomen to the side thoughtfully. 
Is this one of those human word puzzles? he asked. Chakurt let out a chitter of irritation and swept a primary manipulator across the control surface, realigning the letters in an orderly rows the humans preferred. Betty, Gulch read, a common derivative of a human name. Female, I believe. Yes, yes, Strickert said. I am aware of that. However, the base command transport has no sex so far as I know. Gulch let his secondary eyes take in a stress commander. Had he been getting sufficient nutrients lately? In lieu of proper field medic, it was Kotulch's task to ensure the base crew maintained their health. Oh, swarm, Trakart snapped his mandibles at Kotulch. Do stop thinking so loudly. I'm fine. You know, your inappropriate use of that term has had humans thinking they were telepathic. Kotulch reprimanded him. I take zero responsibility for what the humans think, Trakart said. Now this, he waved at the offending female name, is exactly why. Mechanic Steve has named this command transport Betty. Gulch felt his joints loosened with relief. Oh yes, they do that, he said. The transports that drop off the humans are in fact listed by their names, rather than their identification numbers, in the files for the foodstuffs. I'm aware, Gulch. Trakart said, rubbing his ridges over his eyes. If you read the functional briefing on humans, it lists the facet of their behavior. It also lists that they only refer to ships of a certain mass. I was not aware of that, Gultrich said. But Mechanic Steve has named a wheeled vehicle far below the tonnage requirement, Betty, Trakart said. I assume you tried simply asking him, Gulch said. He muttered something inaudible and walked away after asked why he'd given him an inanimate object of name. Tukat said, Since then I've been operating under the assumption that this is some form of what the humans call an acronym. Well, Kutich began to back away slowly. I will get back to my nutrient analysis. One day we will understand the humans, Tukat muttered to himself as he bent back over to the control panel. One day... Kultich made a mental note to check on Trakart's nutrient intake. Sometimes odd behavior was explainable by a poor diet. On another leg, sometimes it was just prolonged exposure to humans. End of story. And that, my friends, concludes this dose of science fiction fun. I hope that you enjoyed and if you did, please don't forget to support the author from the link down below. But if you want to support this channel, there are links as well down below for you to help with. But the easiest way would be to share this video. And if you are so inclined, subscribe as well. I will see you all in the next episode. And I hope that you all have a fantastic time until then. Cheers.